Hi. You think your city has enough trees? I don't think we could ever get too many trees in the city. And I think it would do us a world of good if we just plant a few more. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I have a team of people who are experts on urban forestry, and we're going to have a couple of Pugwash members who will join me in interrogating them about the value and, if any, the potential uh, da downside if, of, of urban trees. Uh, so, uh, in um, uh, I guess in Vancouver is Stephen Shepherd. Is that where you are, Vancouver? Uh, that's correct. Yes, I am. All Leafy right. Kitsilano. Yeah, uh, very good. And and uh, Stephen was, as I understand it, you were the founder of the Department of Urban Forestry at UBC. Is that right? Oh well, it was quite a team of us at the time. But uh, yes, we did uh, we did get that going a few years back now. Uh huh. Okay. Very good. And also, we've got British Columbia all over the place today. Also in British Columbia, more in the hinterland, I think, is David Price. Is that right, David? You're out in the boonies? <laughs> well, it's hardly in the boonies, but yeah, it's in the southern interior between yeah. Kamloops and Kelowna, basically. <laughs> and I would like to point out that I am assuredly not an expert on urban forestry. All right, but you know a tree when you see one. I, I definitely <laughs> you spend a lot of your life modeling uh, forests and uh, doing, you know, crunching numbers having to do with trees, right? Yep, that's basically true, yes. Good. All right, very good. And also in uh, Vancouver is Lorian Nesbitt, who is an assistant professor of urban forestry at the University of British Columbia. So she and Stephen know each other. And uh, we will get back to Lorian right away because I want to give her the first word. Uh, and uh, But in Ottawa are two of my friends who are members of the Canadian Pugwash Group, Ben Collins. <laughs> and Bill Beneja is also there. Bill is a retired uh, bureaucrat from uh, the Canadian government. Is Is that an insulting word to you, Bill, or... Would you like to describe yourself in other terms? I, I used to be science and technology counselor with the foreign affairs, but... Now, Lauren, uh, you're the only uh, woman here, and I think we need to do more to get women. Uh, I don't have enough of you folks uh, on this show. And I'm glad to welcome you because uh, I understand you've got to go in about 15 minutes. So I'd like to have you start off. Um, I guess I should start by saying that um, I'm in the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And aside from sort of just the importance of acknowledging that, I say that also because my research is about urban forestry and environmental justice. And so part of what um, is involved in environmental justice is the participation of different perspectives and nations and the ways in which we live together and, and um, work together in, a, in an equitable way. Um, in urban forestry, I guess my, my research kind of spans um, the more basic kind of, you know, social ecological system of urban forestry and understanding how, um, just how, how, we, how we live together with trees, the benefits we receive from them. But then um, I, as I sort of started observing some disparities in access, for example, or the ways in which different knowledge systems are brought into the discipline, um, I became more interested in the environmental justice aspects of urban forestry. And so looking at things like who has better access to tree canopy cover, which is particularly important for things like climate change adaptation, um, whether urban forest canopy cover or parks are accessible for people of different identities, and mobilities, um, that kind of thing as well as um, the potential harms of planting trees. Although I, I, I personally think that trees are always good. Sometimes the systems which in, within which we plant them can cause problems. Um, so it's not the trees, it's the humans always, but um, something to kind of think through, I think. Pre predisposed to agree with you, but I, I just uh, had a conversation yesterday with one of our other Pugwashites who is anti-tree, <laughs> or in effect so. He thinks of, he 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 looks at all the downsides. So just tell me, what do you think seriously? I I just completely overlook anything that might any reason might one might have for 
for not planting, uh, not wanting to plant trees. So let's start with that. I think we should start by thinking through what planting a tree is. So you plant a tree, um, and that's the thing that everyone talks about, but we also need to provide adequate space for that tree. We need to provide adequate soils for that tree. We need to then provide management care for that tree so that it's healthy thereafter and not causing damage. So one of the things that people are afraid of when planting trees is that there will be some kind of tree failure, branches will drop and cause damage, um, the tree itself may come down. A lot of that, in my opinion, is due to poor um, choice of planting site, poor choice of tree, and then poor management of the tree thereafter. And so I would love us to move towards more of a relationship with trees where we understand that they are living beings and not a bridge, you know, or a car. Well, even a car it needs maintenance, for example, right? And so investing in that management and that ongoing relationship with the trees, um, when we're expecting those trees to give us benefits back, like shading, like stormwater control, we need to give them uh, benefits as well and care. Um, I, I guess the other things that people often talk about are more related to kind of those conflicting values or priorities that we have for what we want to see happening in our cities. So, um you know, I hear that people are upset about trees conflicting with infrastructure or causing sidewalks to heave. They want to remove a tree because um, it's close to their home and they're, they're feeling nervous about um, the roots causing damage to the pipes in their house, for example, um, or even things like trees dropping fruits. That, once again, I think is about choosing the right tree for the right place and then kind of balancing those different values that we have. I personally would like rip out at least half of the roads in Vancouver and plant trees in them, you know, but I know not everyone wants to do that. So it's about kind of balancing those different perspectives, but also having that conversation. I don't really see us having that conversation in cities. We're taking a business as usual approach and we are seeing that our canopies are declining. So I, I think we need to lean into this. I think it's great that you're having this conversation right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, one guy said, oh, the trees are always dropping their leaves and it's a nuisance. And besides, their branches can fall and knock a hole in your roof and or start a fight with your neighbors because they fall in somebody else's property. And, and he, he just, mm -hmm. just didn't like trees, I gather. So <laughs> I, I don't know. We've we got to work on him. Uh. <laughs> well, well, I also think that people need to sort of have, I'm, I'm interested um, more recently in sort of the relationship that people have to nature in cities. And there's some scholarship that suggests that living in a city can alienate you from nature. And I understand that because we don't necessarily have a lot of opportunities to engage actively in stewarding um, aspect, you know, trees or other plants in cities. So the fact that trees drop leaves, I mean, it's like, who cares? You get a chance to go outside and rake leaves, or you can even hire someone to do that yourself if you have the means. Um, I think it has a lot to do with whether we're alienated from nature or not, whether we think it's something important in our lives or whether we just want to live amongst a bunch of skyscrapers. Well, one of the things that uh, one of the angles that we with the Pugwash proposal have in mind is trying to uh, set up a system where we have people actively engaged in uh, a big campaign to uh, plant trees in their neighborhood. You know, we I could imagine the Canadian government announces at such and such a date. Uh, please, uh, those of you who are interested, please show up at Riddell and Marley. And we will have spades and trees and dirt and biochar and, um, you know, whatever uh, other uh, rocks that you want. And we will show you where uh, there's a place uh, along the street for you. In fact, if you need help digging, uh, we've got a, a steam shovel that will come <laughs> and, and, uh, and help uh, break up the concrete or something so you have a place to plant your trees. And then after that, uh, you and your high school kids will each own, uh, re be responsible for the, the care and upkeep of these trees because you've got to water them for a couple of years and weed them and, and everybody's going to take care of the trees and you'll get acquainted with your neighbors and you'll have a good time. So, uh, please show up, uh, next Saturday. How about that? I mean, I think that's great. I like that there's the, um, that there's the commitment to sort of at least some management or stewardship thereafter. Um, I know Stephen does a lot of work sort of getting people to relate to their, um, the trees in their street and in their neighborhood. So he can probably talk more about that. I guess the only thing I would say is that 
in some of the, if you take an equity lens, some of the cities I've talked to have found there's some resistance to tree planting unless the city will, um, or, or some other organization will commit to um, providing some of that sort of larger maintenance, like pruning or removal if necessary um, in the future. And so there's a lot of, you know, tree planting and tree giveaway programs in the United States, for example. And some neighborhoods, particularly neighborhoods with more renters or lower income tenants will um, resist planting trees because they don't have the means to take on that financial burden. And so it does need to be a partnership between the individuals and, you know, taking the time to make that relationship with trees and be stewards and also then the support of um, the, the city or the region to, um, you know, provide support for those who have uh, lower means in terms, especially financial means to maintain the trees on their street. Yeah, it's not just financial, too. I mean, I'm old and I, I couldn't do it yeah. anymore. But, uh, you know, yeah. I think high school kids would benefit a lot from it. In fact, I know uh, here in Toronto, some people who have a program with uh, grade school kids and they take mm -hmm. them out into the ravines and show them how to collect seeds uh, for mm. trees and they actually grow them in coffee cans and things one woman told me whenever you want some trees uh, my kids have got a lot of them for you so uh, I'll look forward to planting some trees that the children have, have raised from seeds and I don't know will it be realistic to ask the kids to come and, and water them every now and then I think that's very neat. The fact that they're actually growing them from seed and instead of going through the entire process of, mm. of um, producing and, and raising a, a tree. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Today in the Globe and Mail, there's an article, I think it's today's uh, Globe, has an article about um, the, the fact that apparently um, the Toronto people's plant, uh, did it say something like 150,000 trees a year? which actually I think we could do better than that uh, because I imagine they have to take out a, a lot too with uh, all this emerald uh, ash borer disease and so on. But um, at, at any rate, they plant a lot of trees, but as I understand it, the um, mortality rate is very high. So it seems that there's a lot of difficulty involved in maintaining trees in a healthy condition. So one of the things that they mention is a, a new organization, or maybe it's not new, but it, and it's certainly not original idea, but they have, as I understand it, someplace there's a field about the size of a football field where they, they have uh, put sections in with different kinds of soil, different species of trees, and they're experimenting to see uh, what the conditions are that uh, are optimal for maintaining the health of various trees. And apparently one can consult them um, before deciding what and where and how to plant. Uh, is this a widespread, uh, is this a unique thing or is, is it something everybody's been doing all along that I didn't know about? Um, I don't know. I mean, maybe others could comment. I don't know that that I'm not sure about whether there are sort of those types of programs everywhere. But I think urban ecologists and soil scientists, you know, could really talk about the conditions that are necessary for for trees to survive. And I know that there have been there's been a bit of work around sort of fungal inoculations, for example, to see whether mycorrhizal um, relationships could support urban trees the way they support um rural trees or um, trees in, in less disturbed landscapes. But um, so, so it does seem that there are multiple factors that are influencing tree decline. Um, my understanding from speaking with some of my colleagues and, and maybe David or Stephen could um, jump in in a second on this is that um, we're certainly not setting up trees for success in many cases because when we create um, a roadscape, for example, or, um, or build a house, we remove a lot of the original soil and then we replace that with largely sand. Um, and so the trees already don't have um, the, the nutrients or the, the soil quality that they need to survive in a, I think in a, a vigorous way. So yeah, there's lots of research that's showing that um, it seems that in the first sort of 10 to 15 years, as much as half of the trees that you plant can die. Okay, is, are you saying that it's getting worse? Did I hear you, did I misunderstand you that it's, that? This tree survival is not as good as it used to be in cities. Oh, I don't. I don't know. 
You don't know. Oh, okay. No. Okay. Okay. Who can who can answer, amplify her answer about where other people are doing this kind of um, experimental work? Yeah, I'm not sure if I've got a lot of details on that matter, but um, there are certainly uh, lots of research studies being done. I know Susan Day, Dr. Susan Day from from UBC, one of our colleagues, um, has done a lot of work in that area, and she would be able to answer that question a lot better, I think. Um, I th I, so I think there's a lot of research going on. I think the problem is, um, is there enough uh, sort of systematic and uh, sort of quite visible um, demonstrations of how these things can be done? And, and in other words, how, how do we spread the knowledge um, about things like soil conditions and soil maintenance and tree type. I mean, there's lots in the literature about specific trees and specific sort of soil or shade conditions, things like that. Um, but things are changing. I know there's a lot of new work on structured soils, for example, and this is the idea of, you know, giving the, the trees, especially the root zone, a much healthier environment that's not compacted and there's not just sand, like Lorian says, or or a clay, it's a structured soil that can absorb uh, water, can hold and retain water, but still has air spaces. Trees have to breathe. And one of the problems where you do see decline in trees, and this is, it could be young trees or old trees, um, is where they're sort of wedged into these heavily compacted spaces. So even in a fairly leafy suburb that people, some of us are lucky enough to live in, those trees are, really sort of stuck. Their, their root balls are very often limited. They've got a heavily compacted road about, you know, a yard or a meter away from them. Mm -hmm. And some of them are real, you know, urban old growth. I mean, we've got massive elms and beautiful maples, and we used to have lots of even native cedars and things like that um, in pretty urban environments or sequoias even. And sometimes, you know, they're carpeted with asphalt right up to the root. Mm -hmm. right up to the trunk. But the ground space underneath, which no one thinks about, is massively important. And so if a big tree falls over when it's 100 years old, A, you've had 100 years of benefits, but B, you probably should have given it a root space that would have let it grow for 300 years and stand up. Mm -hmm. So everything Lorian said is exactly right. Uh, <clears throat> we ask an awful lot of these trees that are giving us all these ecosystem benefits. And yeah, they do drop leaves, but Leaves a fertilizer, folks. That's how you recycle the, the system. And don't get me going on. I'll talk about leaf blowers later. But uh, <laughs> and I'm with you on leaf blowers, Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but I think you, you asked a really important question, Matta. And um, I'm not sure I have really good numbers on this, but but in terms of decline, there are so many things happening now that weren't happening 20 or 50 years ago. You know, a lot of trees, uh, certainly in, in Canadian cities, were, were planted a good while ago. So there, some of them are aging out or becoming more susceptible due to age. Obviously, you have massive changes in climate. So that's wind strength, that's, you know, uh, saturation, it's drought, it's heat. They clobber trees, right? And again, if you don't have the root space and the care and the stewardship and the watering during droughts, we're going to lose them. And a lot of we're seeing a lot of natives in BC uh, dying out, um, and and some of the older trees are being uh, hastening in their demise mm -hmm. because of things like that. Melbourne is another great example of you know the so heat. So it is it is out getting of worse. You would say the mortality rate of trees is declining in in over time in urban areas. I wish I had better numbers to support that, but just my mm -hmm. impression just from watching trees in in the parts of Vancouver that I frequent, I've certainly seen that. I've seen a considerable die-off of conifers, mature conifers. Some of that is related to, um, you know, root diseases as well that, that have become worse when they're, when they're in drought conditions. Um and we've seen uh, significant impacts from the heat dome on, on trees young and old. Uh, and I think a lot of the numbers that you're talking about of mortality rates are to do with young trees and whether they're well watered mm -hmm. enough. And 
they may have gator bags, but there's someone topping up and filling the gator bags, you know. What's a gator so, bag? So uh, my, my sense is I'd be very surprised if, if the, 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 um, if, if trees are, were, were not declining in health generally. And Can I just I say something quickly before I have to? Mm -hmm. I, I just want to comment on that quickly before I have to run. We are seeing, it seems, a decline of canopy. It's not clear whether that's due to increased tree mortality, but I think Stephen's right. It is likely that we're seeing more tree mortality. Um, we are seeing loss of canopy as we build our cities out, as we densify, there's just less space for yeah. trees and we're not thinking creatively about how to create that space. We're doing a business as usual approach. Um, but we are seeing um, certainly, you know, more storms, more destruction from storms. Um, as Stephen said in BC, there's particular concern about uh, Western red cedar because they're really failing in our, in our large forests as well as on our streets. Um, so it is, cedars, I think even if there's not. Sorry, cedars, you said yeah. cedars are particularly failing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, Western red cedar. I mean, do you so, know why cedars? No, are maybe Stephen knows, but I, from talking to the urban foresters here, there's some confusion about whether it's just drought stress or whether there are other factors that are also stressing mm -hmm. um, cedars in particular. <clears throat> Two things you rushed right past. I don't know what a, an alligator bag is, and and the second thing, Stephen, is um, you mentioned. Don't get me started on leaf blowers. <laughs> I heard myself that leaf blowers are are bad news, but I. I the only thing I heard was that they kill earthworms. And I understand that earthworms are not indigenous to Canada anyway. So maybe well, we don't even earth want earthworms. Tell me what, what your objections are to uh, uh, your, your fondness for alligator bags and your, your aversion to leaf blowers. <laughs> Okay, well, David, jump in here because I'm sure you you could you contribute a lot to some of these discussions here. But um, well, just to quickly answer your question, so gator bags, as they, as they're called, I, I suppose it's a short abbreviation of uh, of alligator. Uh, they're these sort of very often green or grey plastic bags that you see around the base of usually small trees, and they're designed to help smallish trees, newly planted trees, over the first you know two or three years. To, to hold to, to give them a sort of a, um, a, a longer duration watering. So you it's like a bag with a, the zip and you put it around the tree. It's got an open bottom and you fill it up with water. And rather than sprinkling or irrigating, which can be less Hold on, wait a minute. I'm lost. Wait a minute. You mean that this is you the 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 root ball is inside this bag before No, not the root ball. It sits on the ground. So you plant the tree, hopefully in a in a nice, good wide space with good soil and soil amendments, etc. And and then you would water it conventionally. But then in order to maintain regular watering over over the whole summer, um you create a sort of an extra container of water that sits around the tree, around the tree stem, and right sitting on the ground where the tree is planted. And it's usually, you know, it could be 18 inches in diameter, sometimes more, um, and maybe, you know, two or three feet high, something like that. And, and, you, and a truck will come along or local people will water uh, just by putting a hose in the top, fill it up, and gradually that water will soak in. But it doesn't go all at once. So if you put that much water on all at once, three quarters of it's going to run off right away, so right? You, and usually you into little, the little drain. tiny holes or something in in the bag. No, no, the bag is waterproof. But you put it has an open top. Put water in the top. The bag holds. It's like a tube. And the only place the water can get out is through the ground by slowly soaking in. And what it doesn't do is run off into the gutters or onto the sidewalks. Mm -hmm. It holds it in place while the water column gradually gets absorbed. It makes all the water available to the roots of that tree rather than being left to oh. spread around around it. Uh, okay. Yes, it's much okay. more efficient. Those, are, those yeah. are beneficial. Those help a lot. Yes, right? those help a lot as long as when they dry out <laughs> uh, within a you know a couple of days. Somebody goes back in, goes back in, and tops them up, uh -huh. uh, especially in, in hot summer, dry conditions. Okay, all right, that sounds good. Now, what what what's the problem with leaf blowers? Well, uh, let's let, how how do we count the ways? Um, <laughs> so, 
uh, people often complain about leaf flows because they're noisy and they produce mm-hmm. dust, etc. Um, and they're also quite problematic um, for the operator because they tend to blow up in this dust and and usually there's a road nearby and roads are uh, repositories of many toxic substances that come from tires and oil and and vehicles generally all that stuff gets mixed up and put into the air and is breathed in but the biggest problem i would say this is my own opinion here is that you have a leaf blower and you hire and spend money on leaf on on people with a leaf blower to do a couple of things they're going to clean up a, a usually a green lawn or or a sidewalk to to make it clean neat you know that that is what we consider to be good citizenship this is clean neat orderly you know orderly frames this kind of thing right it's an aesthetic right um but what it's doing is removing the very nutrients uh, in the, from the, at least the ones that come from the trees, the leaves, that yep. are meant to go back into the ground as a part of the nutrient cycle. And you're, you're removing from the tree its own way of fertilizing itself mm-hmm. and improving soil moisture, soil organic matter, uh, soil water retention. So that soil underneath is being deprived of those nutrients and if we and the bigger problem usually is lawns you can see why people obviously need to clean or sweep or somehow clean street uh, uh, roads and streets and 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 pathways but the lawns are there to protect the water protect the soil and if we don't have a way of cycling that somehow so that what 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 we really need to do is reduce the amount of lawn area and have enough nearby area within the root zone of these trees where leaves can be stored and allowed to compost and rot and turn into soil. And we design, so like Lorian said earlier, we don't design many of our streets or our front yards or our backyards to do that. And so we spend money and time whisking up these leaves and put them in bags and a big truck comes and takes them away. And we're, and the, the, the landscape is crying out for leaves, leave these leaves, leave the leaves, you know. Okay. Well, I am so glad you said that because I have I have been on a real campaign against lawns, but that's not part <laughs> of the argument that I've used. I just don't like uh, I, I, for a thousand other reasons. I think there are so many detrimental things about lawns. You know, they 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 absorb water. They require uh, uh, pesticides. They, they and and. I I much have, rather have trees. I mean, I have been. I'm I'm looking right out my window at uh, a big lawn surrounding. A, I'm in a high rise condo, and I've been running a campaign to try to get them to plant Miyawaki forests out in the backyard. Uh, but th- there's a little problem there because my uh, underground parking is is under that lawn, and the soil is only about a foot deep now. So I have <laughs> have some difficulty finding uh, the kinds of trees that they could plant all over the lawn, and, and I think some people would go along with it if if I could uh, just put a little more energy into lobbying them. Anyway, thank you for that. I'm glad to. And uh, uh, David, you uh, concurred with his opinion about leaf blowers, right? <laughs> I hadn't thought about it that much. I've never had one. I, I mean, I think they're dirty, smelly things. But I suppose if I were to buy one, it would have to be re- with rechargeable batteries. Um, anyway. You know, there's a little controversy about the value of uh, urban trees for uh, the project that we have in mind, which is our, our rationale is that we're trying to uh, 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 find things that enable us to reduce climate change. And what we're finding is that urban tr- urban forestry is not going to help at least for 20 years or so in uh, sequestering carbon. It, it takes too, too long to do. But there are other ways in which the trees cool the cities in indirect ways. They, you, they make the cities more livable. So I'd like your, your thoughts about why, uh, give us some good arguments uh, since Lorian, uh, you know, has, 
has uh, not given us uh, very compelling reasons why we should hate trees. Perhaps uh, I can ask you for some reasons why urban dwellers should uh, want more trees. David, did you want to take a, 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 a first shot at that? I'm happy to. Well, I've had a few thoughts listening to you and to Lorian, <clears throat> and, and one response to Meta's sort of idyllic view of, of the government ordaining that we will dig up concrete and plant have armies of school kids planting trees. Um, I think there's a problem with this, and I have a maybe a better suggestion, which is that many of the problems of urban trees that you have explained, Stephen, are that relate to the fact that we're planting them along or planning to plant them along roadsides and maybe in people's backyards where the space available for them is really quite limited and there's going to be compaction and other factors that contribute to not creating the best growing environment for those trees. So I would suggest that it would be better for cities in particular to think not so much about planting their streets as maybe digging up entire city blocks and turning the occasional block into a small uh, urban forest area where the trees themselves are basically able to, they can mutually shade, they can have better water absorption, they can do all the things that we like about trees. You don't need leaf blowers to clean up, the leaves can be decomposing on site. Um, people can use this as a public space for amenity, recreation, all, the, all those good things. And, and you've got a sort of self-contained little tree community it will support bird life and everything else. So many of those problems with urban trees go away and many of the benefits are retained. And in fact, the climatic and carbon benefits, limited though they may be, will still accrue because the cooling effect from those trees is basically due to their evapotranspiration and doesn't matter whether they're spread along a tree or condensed into an occasional patch. If the leaf area is the same, under the same uh, weather conditions, they will transpire just as much and produce just as much cooling at a local scale. And the carbon benefits are pretty darn small, but you'll still get the carbon benefits accruing in those trees. I so thought my suggestion that to there, get the benefit of the trees, you had to be walking under the tree. And certainly in a hot summer day, you would prefer to walk under trees. But and, and you're indeed, saying that even if you... Is, don't have them right next door, that if you have a bunch of trees uh, in the next city block, you're going to get a lot of benefit from that too? Absolutely. And, and let's face it, the reason why you feel cooler is not because the air temperature is lower. It's because you're getting shaded from the direct rays of the sun. If you really want to go and cool down, you go and sit under a bunch of trees and you will get more shade and more radiative cooling than you would get from a single tree in your backyard. Not to say that a single tree in your backyard is a bad thing. It's just that I mean, people don't walk along the street to stay under the shade of the trees. They walk along the street because they're going from A to B. Mm -hmm. and, and, and basically, they're going to suffer the same air temperature, even if they are shaded from, from the sun along that. Ah, let's get, I mean, if we, if we think about towns in France, where I've seen many, many situations where you have trees all the way along the street, it's great. No, don't, don't get me wrong. But to go to the step of taking a, a Canadian cityscape and, and basically ripping up the sidewalks, ripping up the street, maybe ripping up people's yards to make room for a row of trees, that, that seems to me like a fool's errand. Why not have these public spaces where people, everyone can meet and, and do all these things that that we we appreciate. We just need more urban parks. Mm -hmm. well, I don't oppose that, but, you know, I'm thinking of a video that I watched about Stockholm. Apparently, a few years ago, they, they had a big, they put a whole billion trees in their city. I don't know how many, but, uh, and they had, it, it, they didn't have the neighborhood go out and do it by hand. They had uh, crews of, of people with jackhammers and whatever. But they, but I, they showed they had a, a specific uh, design for how they were going to plant trees, and and they, you know, they all had the same depth of the hole, and then they put uh, something like rocks at the bottom so the tree 
roots could get through, but nevertheless, there was rock, and I think there's biochar in there, and then they'd fill it up, with, the tree would be there, and then on this, it, if they were going to be in a sidewalk, they'd have a metal grill around it, so the water could get into, into the hole, and uh, I haven't seen a follow-up of whether or not those new trees in Stockholm are thriving or not, but they were pretty optimistic in their description of how they thought it would work. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, um, I, I take it, do you think that that is not the most promising way of, uh, of reforesting? Well, I mean, I'm sure you can do all of those things, and I'm sure the cost per tree is going to be in, uh, extortionate. If you were to think of doing similar treatments for an entire city block, let's take, a, a, I don't know, an area where, for whatever reason, most of the houses are run down and it's either going to be redevelopment to a high rise or maybe turn it into something different. You could do all of those amelioration uh, amendments to the soil. You could do the rock and the nice drainage and, and the quality soil. Just cut it all in and lay it out and plant the trees. The cost per tree is going to be way lower because of the, co the economies of scale. Stephen might have more ideas or opinions on this. Well, I, I, I think you raise a really important point, which is, David, that, that, that if you can, you know, it's possible to do neighborhood level cooling, for sure. And if you have enough trees, um, then that will cool the air, which is really what you're talking about, by several degrees. And that will improve mortality rates and, and all this kind of thing. And, and, and you, you make a point about, you know, if we could aggregate these areas and create new parks, um, I agree that would be a fabulous thing. It would, it would, it would improve access to nature, the, the many great things. But I think it's a bit more complicated than that because really there are the sort of three domains of the urban forest. There's like, like you said, this sort of the park where you could, pack in trees and get those big sort of cooling effects in that immediate neighborhood and 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 the, have a sort of more natural cycling, maybe rewilding, those kinds of things would be terrific. Um, but there's also the streetscape, which we've talked about quite a bit, which um, does provide pretty, uh, it, it may or may not, oh, sorry, I apologize for that. Uh, it may or may not, um, it may or may not, cool the whole neighborhood. But if you can start to get the canopy up to overall something like 40%, that's sort of optimal for these sort of neighborhood cooling effects. And you probably aren't going to get enough park situations to get to the overall 40% canopy cover levels. So you're going to need some of those street trees, which are still under public control. But the third domain is, is the private yard or the, the you know, the, the, the backyards, the front yards, Mm -hmm. And to some extent, the alleys, and and where, unfortunately, that can be you know up to fifty percent of the canopy cover, more sometimes in some in some in some communities in Canada and beyond. So I, I feel like we do need to put emphasis, more emphasis, on better <laughs> management of those private spaces, and that really can only be done apart from strengthening tree protection bylaws, which are very weak in many places, they're trumped by rezoning. We've done studies on this recently, looking at Canadian policies across Canada. Um, and that's what we're being told is when there's redevelopment, the trees come out. Mm -hmm. But even in existing neighborhoods, there's lots of potential for more trees if we can overcome these cultural barriers that we talked about earlier matter and i think that's that is still a significant piece of the puzzle we have to address and our approach and a lot of our recent research has been going to how can we get regular citizens canadians residents even apartment dwellers to yes plant more trees um, and yes reduce maybe not eliminate but reduce lawns so we have this more this more pervious area more more green space some of that can definitely be used to shade buildings on the south and southwest uh, and west aspects where they get the most heat. That can reduce energy bills, uh, air conditioning bills, um, and improve, improve health. 
And plus, if you can get a certain amount of trees around buildings, the science also shows that those reduce energy use in winter through sheltering against winds, especially the, the less efficient the houses are. So there are these multiple benefits to private trees that most people are not really aware of. And what we've been trying to do in programs like the Citizens Cool Kit uh, program in Vancouver and the Oak Bay Cool Kit program in Oak, in Oak Bay on Vancouver Island is work with uh, whole neighborhoods of people so that they kind of collectively can begin to uh, not only um, improve the, the urban forest conditions in their own unknown space where they have some agency, you know, here's something they can actually do and they don't have to wait for the city to, to do it. But they can also, uh, you know, have those stewardship programs on the public trees. They, they fill up those gator bags for those young trees. They water, I've been watering the, the, our old growth trees, our old elms um, with a hose, uh, with a drip hose in the droughts to try and keep them alive. You know? Because if we can keep those old trees alive and healthy longer, that makes room for the young trees that are going to take 20, 30 years to really develop the full ecosystem benefits to come up. If we lose the old trees prematurely, you know, we're going to have this gap um, and things are going to get a lot worse. So I, I feel like it has to be a multifaceted thing. Um, I don't think Canada has a very good system of, and, and, and maybe other countries too, of integrating these these urban forest plans and strategies and bringing the community into that in a, in a more serious way. There are some good examples, the Toronto Leaf Program, uh, the stuff we're doing in Oak Bay right now, we're getting people working on depaving their yards and working with the cities on the public right of way to, to take back some parts of the street, you know, depaving uh, parts of the street but still allowing access and all these kinds of things. So I think the solutions are there, but we need much better engagement of whole communities and stakeholders, whole neighborhoods. And I'll, I'll just put in a pitch for a new extension program that we've started up at UBC called Climate Action and uh, Community Engagement. It's a micro certificate for professionals and community leaders to, to learn these skills on how could we bring in green infrastructure and other climate solutions through, uh, you know, active climate, local climate champions. And it's trying to get towards shifting culture away from negativity to trees and pave your backyard so you can park your cars and leaf blow and everything away and get them into a much more harmonious relationship with nature in a way that reduces the, the, the downsides and improves their health and, it's, and these can be fun, positive, collective action things to do. And the research shows that people are looking for those kinds of solutions. People are worried it. about climate change. What can we yeah. do? This is something you can do. Great. Listen, you just said something. You, you said the magic word parking. You know what's going to happen. We're going to have electric taxis within five years. And you are not going to want to own a car because it'll be it'll be $5,000 a year less expensive to go everywhere with a driverless taxi than to own a car. So there won't be any need for parking spaces because these cars, these taxis, they come and they pick you up and they drop you off and then they go away. They don't park. So all of those parking spots along the street and even people's garages or these parking pads that they make in their front yards, they can be planted with trees. How about it? I, I, this is my, my big, big cause. Shouldn't we try to tell people in advance, look, get ready for it, folks, because there are going to be a lot of empty parking places, even in shopping malls. Yeah. You know, the, the, we don't, we, people won't be having cars. And so let's get ready to park, plant trees. Well, I, I do think, I, I do think if there was a sort of formal systematic strategies, and maybe this is part of what, what the Pugwash uh, initiative could do is to, is to ask governments, local, provincial and federal to, to suggest, you know, do these sort of forward projections. I agree with you. I think that the the 
space requirements for what we call car habitat will, will shrink over time and should. And we want to expand what we call worm habitat and squirrel habitat, you know, trees and pervious area um, and for multiple benefits, not just for biodiversity. So uh, I think that we just need a little clearer visions of what this might look like, what the co-benefits might be, to see if we how much we can shift. It, it's still going to be a lot of sort of public money, public funding, and it comes with all those difficulties and timing, et cetera. But the more these things can be systematized and normalized as this is what's happening. In COVID, we had pop-up parks all over the place, right? And it demonstrated that you could rapidly take back road space. We put in cafes, we put in little pop-up parks. Some of those are being made permanent, not enough in my opinion. Um, but I think this discussion should be pushed forward and some visioning. I'm really keen on visualization and showing people pictures of their own, own block or their own city, their own neighborhood. Here's how it could look. What do you, how do you want it to look? You know, well, look, what is a parking space by the, you know, for parallel parking? It's what, about 15 feet long and maybe eight feet wide? Is that about? Maybe it's slightly less, but yeah, something around that. A little less. But you could put a couple of trees in a space like that, couldn't you? I mean, I think what David said, he's, he's, he's skeptical, but could, couldn't you put some, <laughs> a tree or two? Well, well, what, what they often do, these bulge outs, and they do that for traffic calming. And again, yeah. there's lots of benefits have been been shown from doing that, you know, at the ends of streets or in the middle of the streets. Um, and that can give you, it can certainly expand the root space. It may not be enough for a, a big deciduous tree, which is probably the thing you most want in the, in the long run. Um, but it would certainly improve it over what it is now. And there's no reason why we couldn't have small groves or a medium-sized trees um, to, you know, expand the canopy beyond the big trees that are already there. But uh, uh, there were some other questions, Meta, that, that we should perhaps Yeah, I'm, I'm monopolizing. Uh, oh, there you go, Robin. Sorry. Hi, I've, I've got three uh, questions. Two of them are related to each other. Um, one is on uh, species selection. Um, and I raise this because uh, we had another massive tree drop in our backyard uh this week from a storm ice storm and uh this is like the sixth tree we've lost and they were all i think 50 to 60 70 year old trees uh, my assumption is that they weren't necessarily all that unhealthy per se but they had reached their their uh, life limit and so maybe they were the wrong trees to have been planted there in the first place. So that first question is on what species should we be looking at uh, for urban trees? Uh, related to that is a question about, <clears throat> and David kind of raised this uh, when he spoke about transpiration. What's the, what's the relative uh, impact of trees from transpiration, that is the release of water um, or the circulation of water, let's say more generally, uh, as compared to canopy that is uh, shading cooling, uh, because transpiration is a cooling effect. Canopy has it. Do we know the, the relative uh, uh, impacts of those? And the third is this issue of uh, if we think that urban trees are really too minuscule to have a carbon dioxide footprint re reduction impact directly, that is by uh absorption of carbon dioxide um uh to what extent is this a reduction of electricity for air conditioning or for heating if you look at it from the other point of view reduction of air conditioning usage uh by cooling uh going to have an impact i know uh, there's some suggesting that it's a, a relatively small number but it's not an an irrelevant number, and uh, I was I sent it, I just circulated an article has a very frightening um, uh, suggestion that we would expect uh, air conditioning to at least triple uh, in the next uh, by night by twenty fifty because of expected global heat uh, warming. Um, 
this would be the equivalent of the combined electricity capacity currently of the United States, the EU, and Japan today. Okay. Massive mm -hmm. amount. So the cooling, uh, if it's minuscule now, it may actually become more and more significant as we as the world crumbles in front of us. So those are my <laughs> three questions. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly answer the first one, David. Maybe you should want to tackle the, the transpiration one, mm -hmm. um, and then we could jump on the, the third one. But mm. um, just on species selection, it makes a huge difference. Um, and so it, in, with, with the, the, the more advanced municipalities, because uh, this is mostly local government's responsibility so far in Canada, uh, um, the, the they are developing um, these sort of tree guidelines for selection based um, partly on sort of soil suitability, um, certainly on longevity, which is, I think, really your question, mm. um, but also uh, drought tolerance is the biggest threat and the biggest limiter, if you like, uh, or if it's a sort of a... a um, there's also sort of heat, heat resilience and, and cold resilience, but drought's probably the biggest killer. And so um, there are certain trees that you want to avoid in those kinds of situations where a tree fall is, is a, a likely hazard in the future. Uh, and again, the big caveat is give it the root space and the, and the care and the watering that it needs to maintain that longevity. Um, so certain trees are just short-lived. Birches are very short-lived. Um, some of the some of the poplars can be very short-lived. Olders, things like that. Uh, the 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 bigger deciduous trees that tend to give you the most ecosystem benefits in the long run, shade in in summer and sunlight and heat gain in the winter, um, tend to have longer life um, uh, life expectancies. And, and, um, and more advanced cities are doing this, uh, um, you know, urban life, you know, life expectancy mapping of different trees and different growth. But it also depends on the pruning. And, uh, you know, whether it falls over uh, has to do with the, the conditions with the roots. And not very often there's a, there's a curb, you know, as I said, a meter away from the tree. And that can very often just mean you've got half a root ball rather than one. Um, but it can also be the shape of the trees. Surrey is, the city of Surrey is going to single leader trees. So to avoid that splitting of, you know, multiple multi-stem trees that, um, that are more prone to big branches falling off. So it's partly, you know, good arboriculture to, to keep those trees in, in a good form. Um, will also lengthen that, that time period. But the, Certainly, species selection guidelines are coming out for trees that are well adapted to those conditions. Uh, so, David, do you want to tackle the transpiration cooling one? Well, I, very briefly, um, I mean, if you think about the, the, the obvious experiment, if you stand under a tree and you measure the air temperature under the tree, you'll get a number. Let's say it's 20 degrees. If you walk 10 meters away and now you're in the open and you measure the air temperature, what do you think you're going to get? It's going to be 20 degrees, plus or minus 0.1 of a degree. People who tell you it's 10 degrees warmer in the open are not measuring the air temperature properly. Evapotranspiration essentially is the production of latent, is a latent heat cause, calling, calling, causing cooling to occur. And that's going to happen, and it basically does lower the temperature of the air in the surrounding in the surroundings. So it's mainly about evapotranspiration and much less about shade. The only caveat is that if you have extensive tree cover, the surface temperature on the soil is going to be lower because the trees have prevented the ground from warming up. So in that regard, under an extensive canopy, yes, the air temperature may well be a degree or two cooler. A lot depends on, on the wind. If there's any wind at all, you can pretty much guarantee that warm air is going to come under. It's going to feel cooler, but it's not actually any cooler and, and come out the other side. There's a lot of mixing going on all the time. Um, so the one other point I want to make, because I realize we're running out of time, 
most of the conversation, Stephen, has come about, you've been talking about Vancouver and Victoria. And of course, these are very uh, humid zones. And, and we have, you know, you have a whole set of conditions on the West Coast, which are relatively unique within Canada. And when we talk about things like uh, ripping out uh, lawns and putting in trees, that's great. But now think about what conditions are like in a city on the other side of the Rocky Mountains, especially in Alberta, where you've got a fraction of the annual rainfall. The big issue there is drought. And, and in fact, there's a lot of incentives to not just take out the gar the lawn, you take out everything and you zero escape the entire yard. Now, that's going to be a really hot yard on a hot day because there's no evaporation really going on at all. But water is such a limited resource that you really mm -hmm. cannot afford to be irrigating your gardens and you need the water for human consumption and other purposes. So we really have to think about the role of tree cover in urban environments and relate it to the climatic conditions in which those cities are found. So again, on the East Coast, Toronto, maybe the, the issues are different. I don't know much about those cities, though I do know that in the summer they can be extremely humid. Now, when you have a lot of humidity in the air, the trees really can't transpire that much because they need that, that vapor pressure gradient in order for the water vapor to be released to the atmosphere. So really, they're not going to transpire very much, so they're not going to create much additional cooling. And if anything, they're going to add to the local humidity, which will actually make things feel worse under some circumstances. Oh, okay, I think I'm done, and they think you're running out of time. <laughs> No, we have uh, one more question I want to get covered, and that's Peter, Peter Mikey's had his hand up. I, ha I just came across two uh, research reports which fascinated me, and I wonder if you would comment on them. One s claims that the city of New York and the forestry and uh, the coverage in New York actually absorbs as much CO2 as the city produces. And the other one is a report by uh, the Rocky M Mountain Institute, which claims now that the cost benefit, doing a very, very general benefit analysis, including health of planting trees and absorbing CO2 is very high. It's a very good benefit you get a lot of benefit for very little cost i i haven't seen those papers so uh, it'd be very interesting yes to see um and and david's probably more much more of an expert on carbon sequestration than i am i'd be i'd be surprised by that that ratio for new york i think you'd have to look at exactly what emissions they're measuring that are being balanced yeah. I, I was god smacked by it yes yeah <laughs> So, so what's the reference? Where's the what's the report? I'll I'll send it to I I'm sorry, I haven't got it right here. I can send it to Meta and she could send it on or something. I think I've seen it. Yeah. I, yes, I, I sent it to you. I sent it yeah, to you. It was yeah. quite an amazing yeah. finding. Okay. Well, so we're informed, but now we're at least made curious enough to look it up. I'll try to maybe I can uh, listen. If you have further thoughts, uh, on our website to save the world.ca. That's where I post these uh, videos after I've edited them. And there's underneath the, there, there's a public comments column. So if you have further thoughts or you want to dispute something somebody else said, you can always go there and have a discussion, uh, post your thoughts, even, you know, a year from now. <laughs> I don't know whether anybody be looking at it a year from now, but, but uh, you can, you can post it at any time there. So if I find any more out about the New York uh, CO2 ratio, uh, maybe I can post it there or we can uh, put some further information uh, about both of those studies because I think they're both very informative. Okay, you're right. We have run out of time and I wish we had uh, another hour or so with you guys because I've enjoyed every minute of it and uh, I feel much wiser and smarter than I did an hour ago. So thank you both, all of you. Uh, uh, both of you experts and and my dear Pugwash friends for uh, a, a very enjoyable afternoon. Take care. Thank Bye. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Project Save the World produces these shows, and this is episode number 538. You can watch them or listen to them as audio podcasts on our website, to savetheworld.ca. People watch information there and share it about six global issues. And to find a particular talk show, you can enter its title or episode number in the search bar or the name of one of the guest speakers. Project Save the World also produces a quarterly online publication, Peace Magazine. You can subscribe for $20 Canadian per year. Just go to pressreader.com on your browser and in the search bar, enter the word peace. You'll see buttons to click to subscribe.